All right, go ahead. This is Cindy Dale, and this is your superior self. Cindy Dale, one of my favorite people in the entire world. Cindy, thank you so much for joining us again. Oh, I feel like I'm turning as pink or red as my shirt. So thank you. That's a real honor. Uh, I just, I have to say this, right? So last time you were on the show, and I'm wearing blue because of the last conversation, maybe it was on our conversation, maybe it was off the air. Um, we talked about the possibilities of me having a book and you had a, some insight of me talking to a group of people, um, about something. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was my book. Um, and that I would be nervous and it just let me down this great inspirational picture of me doing this. So like a month ago, I'm actually giving a talk at work. Um, not about the book, just kind of like at work, I'm wearing a blue sweater. I'm like sitting there talking in front of people, maybe like a group of 10 to 15. And in the middle of my talk, I'm, you know, just talking to them, giving, giving them advice about things, nothing in particular. I have this memory of Cindy Dale saying, you'll be speaking in front of people in a blue shirt. I look down, I'm wearing my blue V neck sweater. I'm like, oh my God, like, I hope this is what <laughs> she wasn't talking about. I hope this is something different. But I was nervous and I was just like, ah, oh, here we go. So I, in memory of that conversation, I'm wearing a blue sweatshirt right now. And I'm not nervous because I'm talking to you, but thank you I for everything. I noticed the blue and I remembered, I think it was offline. We talked about blue. You're, you have a gift of blue. That's the, if we're going to talk weird language, that's the fifth chakra. That's about communication. That's one of the colors of people gifted in communication. I mean, obviously look at what you're doing right now. You're interviewing, you have this amazing podcast, you know, and I really get that same sense again, you know, just sort of that path beckoning you and you walking on it, speaking, teaching, um, helping, helping. I mean, I think you've got a healing heart, actually. It doesn't mean hands-on, you know, it means inspirational. That's mm. the word that pops to me today. Mm. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of things going on recently that I've really been taking notice of a lot of synchronicities that have been popping up that are kind of like the universe trying to get my attention. And it's pretty common when I see it, um, numbers, series of numbers, patterns of numbers that are just popping up. And it's not, it's not by chance. It's not something that, oh, I, I just now recognize it. It's something that is forcefully in my face every time I glance up. So <clears throat> the universe is working with me. I feel like there's energy changing. I feel like my energy is changing dr dramatically, um, you know, and, you know, listening to your work, I see that you're increasing your speaking appearances. Uh, you've got a, a lot of things going on right now. Uh, I know your son has baseball, but outside of that, you, you are doing a lot of activities. I'm doing a lot of talking, writing more books like that's really needed in the world. Um, <laughs> but I'm doing it anyway. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting for me on my path is I've been a single mom for a long, long time for both my sons and a foster daughter and many, many animals. At one point I had three kids, five animals and a very small house. I still have a very small house, but there's uh, it's okay, you know, because um, the number of beings in here is shrunk. <laughs> so, so I can move in it, um, you know, etc. cetera. Um, but I decided years ago that I didn't really want to, you know, kind of like, I, what, whatever the word is, you know, kind of like really show my face that much in the world. I certainly didn't want to travel too much. I wanted to raise my kids. And as soon as my youngest went off to college, the speaking engagements really started to come in and he's pretty much cooked now. Like they're never really cooked. <laughs> they never, they leave home, but they come home mm -hmm. <laughs> constantly anyway, which is, which is heartwarming. Um, you know, but it really did all my teaching, especially like through the shift network, you know, really picked up, you know, sort of as my youngest, you know, was able to fly more. So I do believe the universe has a plan leads us. I know looking back, sometimes I wasn't so happy with what appeared around me. I was like, well, how come I don't have this? Or how come I have to do this? Or where's my chef? Where's my maid? <laughs> you know, you know, where's the this or whatever it is that we fantasize about in, you know, the head. But I know you know this 
Trey, and you live like this and you're going to be sharing this, I'm cheating a little bit. You know, it's about being where you are and the universe comes to you if you hold your heart in that place of, you know, some form of positivity, some form of, I think it has to be spiritual positivity, not just like the fake bliss, uh, not just I'm going to spiritually bypass, but, but in a way that makes it real and you live it with actions too. Mm, yeah. You have to do the action. Like you have to, you know, you have to take care of that seed that you plant, right? Um, what, whatever that may be, what, whether that seed is a, is a huge dream or a book or a talk or something like that. Like you just have to put in the work to actually, you know, maintain that. And what I found for myself in writing my manuscript uh, is being grateful for things, even like the bad stuff in my life. I, I am grateful for that because I'm here. I'm stronger for that. Like I, I look back, I don't even recognize those, that, that person that I was. I mean, it's evolution of consciousness and it's finest. Um, what about you? Like, have you found that to be true for yourself? Absolutely. And that's where it's helpful for me to take a look back and go, wow, you know, that big boulder in the road. Oh, that was the best thing. I got to sit on it for a while. <laughs> I got to sit in the sun, you know, or I went around it. And because I went around it, this happened. It is just that human way that I think we all have of struggling. It's sort of like the spoiled brat part of all of us. I have that that goes, well, I want it now, or this isn't what I want. I want this instead. And even like you're talking about how the universe gives signs and omens. Uh, I had a dream. 20 years ago. And frequently I'm led by a voice. You can call it what you want, you know, God, universe. It's not me though. I know what I sound like. And it's not nearly that James Earl Jones sounding <laughs> in my head. So every so often this voice comes and I have a little trepidation when it speaks. It's usually, you know, kind of the dawn, twilight, waking up, going to sleep kind of a thing. 20 years ago, this voice, my voice, the dark, deep uh, voice, you know, said, you're going to write, you're going to be asked to write um, a series of books, each featuring a chakra. And I was like, yeah, that's exciting. So I waited, I waited, I waited. Nobody asked me to do this. I brought it up. I pitched it to a couple publishers. Nobody wanted it. Maybe seven, eight months ago. One of my publishers, Llewellyn, gave me an email and said, we'd love you to write a series of books, each featuring a chakra, 20 years. <laughs> mm. And I had to chuckle because that's how the universe works too. It's not really so much about what we think of as consecutive linear time and space. We're very outdated with that digital you know, kind of way of living. And there's a whole different neurology I like living in now instead of the digital, you know, kind of planning it and thinking it. And it and it opens to what you're talking about, that appreciation, that being in gratitude. And I'm teaching myself, even when something shocking happens, um, like there, <laughs> there was one day I was going to teach a class and I'm adding on to my backyard and my uh, lawn guys, great guys cut the cable, you know, an hour before I'm like, I don't see what I'm supposed to be grateful for here. <laughs> right. <laughs> However, as everything unfolded, when the cable people did arrive later that day, which is pretty miraculous, they found like some other wires that were off that, that would have undone my system anyway. So it's like one sharp, you know, one small problem solved, you know, kind of future problems. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's about gratitude. And I'm sure you find this too, you know, having that sense and sensibility, not to expect, but to be in expectancy. That's mm -hmm. kind of how I approach it. Sure. myself. Yeah, that, that trust factor, really, like, trust. like, putting it in the hands of God, and allowing him well, I shouldn't say him, allowing the I'm universe, good with him. the source, whatever you want to call it, the larger I consciousness system, allowing that to just take care of the plan and let it roll off your back, work towards it, right? 
be grateful for the opportunity that you can do these things for it, better yourself, have a goal, go towards it. But life does get thick. Life does remind you that you're not in your goal. <laughs> you know, it, it takes away that, 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 that moment when you feel inspiration, inspirational and the next minute you feel defeated. In that defeated moment, you have to rely on these types of um, positive psycho psychological um, practices that you put, implement for yourself, meditation, gratitude, gratitude journal, and just having faith that God, if it is a part of that plan, that it will, that it will be, but also having the gratitude to say, I have an opportunity here to achieve this. I never know what tomorrow is going to bring. It may not bring this thing, but I have an opportunity to try to achieve it. I just say amen. Years ago, I read a book by a Christian author. I think his name is John Eldritch, and it was written for men. His wife wrote books for women. I didn't really like that book. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I got enough guy in me. <laughs> and it, he made a beautiful point. He said, when we're in those darkest moments, and we all know what those are, we've all had them. Maybe some of us are in them, at least in one capacity of our life. He said, those are the ones you want to praise, give praise, you want to sing about, because he said, that's where your resistance to God is the thinnest. Mm -hmm. Like, think about it. I, when I'm happy, and I'm happy a lot of the time, it's not bliss. It's sort of a nice, you know, oh, it's good, chill, you know, kind of good feeling. But when I'm in that super happy, love the feeling, like going there, I'm not really asking for anything. You know, I'm not seeking, I'm not exploring as much. I'm not saying, hey, you know, God, can you get a little closer to me or show me how to get closer? Can you help me with this? And I remember when my sons were growing up, you know, when they were, when everything was good and it's still sort of like this sometimes, you know, when it's good, when it's even, they're on their own. They're like, don't bug me, mom. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't need you make the dinner, but make it better than you usually do. And I'll get to it. Um, but it's when they had a need or a question or something going on. It's kind of when they most let me in, certainly also to celebrate, which is a lovely part of life. But I think we're like that with source. I think we're like that with the universe too. Mm -hmm. So it's not that easy. I know you know this to appreciate the darkness, you know, or the dark moments. Um, but they're also the times where my muscles build, my spiritual muscles, my soul gets stronger. And I can certainly relate to people, to all my clients. There's not much they can bring up. And I hear a lot of really challenging stuff that I have not gone through, um, but I can relate to the feelings of it. There's a lot of hardships. I would never tell somebody, you know, just try to be happy in the middle of that or when you're processing. In fact, when I'm writing my books, a lot of times my editors take out the most challenging and the, and the kind of most horrifying of the stories of my clients because they say that's not even believable. Mm -hmm. um, like I remember putting in a, a true story about a client who spent four years chained to a bed being sexually abused. Mm -hmm think of that how are you going to be grateful i mean right yeah, well, how are how you going to have that did feeling she, did she i'm assuming is a she i don't know if you said that yeah but how does she yeah. does she talk about that now is she she talks about it grateful for that i mean how do you well do you, i couldn't put it in the book because they were like that's too mind-blowing you know people aren't going to believe that and it's a bit of the story of um victor frankel who wrote you know his books he created a whole therapy process and approach to life based on years in a concentration camp and he said i had to find meaning in every day whether that be what i wanted to live for you know to meet my you know my mother again even though i think he suspected she was dead um, to write again, to smell a flower again. He said, I searched for meaning in my interactions with the other prisoners. And he said that those who didn't have a meaning to live for or to find in their current moments, they, they were the ones who died more frequently. They were the ones who couldn't 
tolerate, who couldn't handle. They were the ones who turned away, you know, kind of from life and the light. And he hung on to meaning. So I think that's another word we would add in here because that woman, when she was a young, younger person, a teenager chained to a bed, she had the goal of getting out. I know it sounds kind of silly. She wanted to have a Starbucks coffee. <laughs> she had, you know, she was 14 when this started and somehow, you know, she knew about Starbucks. It wasn't about Starbucks and it certainly wasn't about their coffee, but she wanted a slice of normalcy. So she was like, I'm going to live for that. I want to go into a Starbucks, like a normal person, order a coffee, whipped cream, sit down and drink it. And that was her symbol. Does it matter what the symbol is? That was her symbol for surviving through this. Mm. And I met her 10 years after that horror. Certainly she's still scarred. Certainly she's still, and with me was dealing with trauma. She was so appreciative of these small things, the, the coffee, the smell of coffee, having a muffin, having a home, having sheets on her bed. I mean, there's always something I would add meaning, the hope of meaning, if nothing else, you know, to that, you know, kind of to our uh, medicine kit, you know, our medicine bundle for, for deepening and for becoming more, even in the worst of situations. Yes. Yes. I was just thinking about these, these, these types of thoughts today, like gratitude. And I know some people go through situations in their lives where I cannot relate at all, whether it's loss, death, murder, rape, or anything like that. But then what you're talking about meaning, like living through it, having that hope for meaning that you'll get out of that, the light at the end of the tunnel. And what that light at the end of the tunnel does is it allows you to be grateful for the small things that you took for maybe you may have taken for granted before, right? In this story, having a Starbucks, like four years tied up sexual abuse. I can't believe the trauma that is associated with that. I'm sure there's so much trauma, but that's a part of the healing. The gratitude is coming out of that on the other end being thankful that you're there in that moment, this new moment, this new energy, this new vibration, and being able to look at all the little things in life and be thankful for that. That is that is the gratitude. That is how powerful gratitude can be. Now, the healing is something separate. That is something you're going to have to be doing a lot of work with emotionally, mentally, physically, a lot of trauma. But the gratitude, that can help you down a new path, like a new path of living, of being in that moment. It ties you back into the moment, I feel like. Oh, that's such an important point. And it's a spiritual quality. I'm a bit of a, well, more than a bit of a energy geek. <laughs> and I love, you know, kind of, oh, what are understandings of energy in different cultures, spirit, different, different ways to approach it and the science of it. And uh, my my research suggests through science that there actually is a type of light in the universe that some scientists call absolute light. It's pre-Big Bang. Uh, it's in these very still sort of curly cues of light in the universe that don't budge and everything else is moving, you know, kind of forward. It's in what they call dark matter, which is some of the 80% of the dark energy, dark matter in the universe, we don't really understand, but it's the part that bonds everything and everyone together. And all of those and more energy seem to be composed of a type of light that create no darkness. So when you're talking about gratitude, when we're talking about meaning, we're, we're talking about sometimes just simple perseverance can be an enormously intelligent approach to life and a spiritual one. I think we're talking about the existence of a spiritual light. You can use the word spiritual light. You can say absolute light. You know, some kind of light I think most of us feel that's not somewhere else. It's not at the other end of the rainbow. You know, it's not when we're dead. It's not just when we're dead. Like it's here. And gratitude is a tool. It's a hallway to bring that into now. And it is key to transforming. Like you said, healing is, can be a really, I mean, healing's ongoing. It's not so easy. I remember years and years ago, after I started therapy, 
And I um, was dealing with, you know, my own family system stuff, alcoholism, sexual abuse, this and that. You know, I talk about this stuff so lightly now. And I listen to myself and I go, you couldn't have said that like with no charge, you know, 20, 30 years ago. It's, a, it's part of the story. And I weirdly know that it is part of what created me. I would never wish it on anybody, but it's part of it. When I started, I got so therapy. I got so depressed. I think for three months, all I did, I barely dragged myself to college, to classes, and I baked bread. I don't think the loaves, I mean, most of the time the bread ended up like an inch high and I'd still eat it. <laughs> I put butter on it and I'd eat it. And I was like, why do I even want to deal with this stuff? I'm more miserable than when I avoided it. Mm -hmm. Yet here's that component. We also, I think, have an inner, you know, psyche, our soul, that, that butterfly self that wants to get out of wherever we're trapped. We'll keep struggling, dealing with things in order to emerge. And then we get to fly. Doesn't mean it's easy. There's a lot of wind out there um, when we're flying around too, right? There's things that want to eat us, but, um, but we have to do that. And I, I remember what I was grateful for during those depressed months was, you know, bread, butter. <laughs> There's always something, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think, yeah, I think a lot of people could get confused with the gratitude because it, it doesn't mean the healing's done. It means no. you can be grateful, <laughs> you know, like just because I'm grateful for that thing that happened doesn't mean that I'm okay that I did, but I am working on myself and I'm okay. <sighs> I'm not okay. I don't want to want to word this. So it's not like, yeah, take people. your time. It's, it's interesting. It's I'm important. great. Yeah. I'm grateful for the fact that I can look back at that moment of, of trauma or, or something in my life that I consider very traumatic and, and hurt hurtful, but I can look back at it now and I'm grateful that I can have a different perspective. Right. But doesn't mean that I'm fully healed from that. So there's two, it's, it's different. It is separate. They're different paths. And that's so important to point out that they unify, right? There's crossovers, feeling grateful, being grateful, cultivating grateful doesn't cancel off the need to keep healing. And healing is going to go better for the gratitude mm -hmm. also. And I'm with you. I think there's constant need to tend to the garden of the self, you know, and work with trauma as it comes up. And I've been at it for a really long time. I've been in different types of therapy for really a long time. And um, I was kind of feeling pretty, oh, maybe I'm doing, you know, I'm kind of, I didn't think I was complete, but for about a year, I was like, no, I'm good. <laughs> maybe two years. I was good when everybody else in the pandemic wasn't. I was fine. <laughs> I was like, I'm kind of cruising. I, I'm good. And then what, maybe two, three months ago, I totally triggered. Last year, my son in college baseball had a horrible, challenging year. And he's, he's doing really well. But I went to the games being mother, you know, he had COVID in his back, he'd stand there. I never knew if he could pitch. He never knew if he could pitch. I'm a mom. That is not a happy experience for a mother, right? Then he would cry and then I would feel hopeless and powerless. So when I started to go to baseball this year, I sat there literally in trauma. Honestly, Trey, I was like, I'm trying, I've got PTSD. <laughs> I'm like, I can't calm down. I can't just be that supportive parent. And he's very brilliant. He works his issues. He said to me, mom, keep your, keep your terror to yourself. I don't want it. <laughs> so nothing like, you know, somebody putting you in your place and putting your stuff back in you. Mm -hmm. Good move. And it's been a beautiful journey, even though this has only been a couple months, I've been working through this because more memories surfaced from child that I had just not, not terrible ones. You know, they weren't horrific from that you know, let's measure them. They're at one end of the continuum. They're probably a three out of a 10, 10 being bad, but it was like, oh, I never really 
you know, kind of was okay with success or feeling good about myself or, you know, I never, I always kind of assumed something bad was going to happen. So it gave me another opportunity to return and say, oh, Cindy, you know, that's really sad. You know, let's bring that forward and honestly feel grateful. Not that my son went through all that. That's his gratitude journey. And he actually was grateful, to be really honest, very grateful. You know, but I was like, oh, I'm so glad I've been triggering. <laughs> I'm so glad I could relook at that energy that's inside because that's going to make me a more full person you know, mm -hmm. to deal with it. And I wasn't embarrassed to tell people I was good with it. And, you know, I teach and I write books. And I think there's certain times in our life where we reach a certain pinnacle, you know what I mean? And I'm not up there, but I'm where I am. And I'm like, I had no embarrassment about just being human. And it's interesting because I shared this with people, you know, not everybody, but a few people, they were like, oh, we have the perfect, we can help, or I have a feeling what might help you. So when we're vulnerable in a smart way, then people feel honored to assist too. So I think that all fits into this gratitude part. It's like, wow, I can open my heart and the universe will give, people will give. Hmm. I, I had to say, I'm grateful for meeting you because- <laughs> I walked into a new age bookstore for the first time and I didn't catch fire. Um, <laughs> after all of the rituals and the, you know, the, the, the Eucharist that I've taken the sacraments, I didn't catch fire when I walked in. Um, I found some pretty cool genres, new genres that I like. There was, you know, a couple of things I, that I wasn't interested in, but for the most part, I walked in and all I saw was Cindy Dale books. They were like <laughs> everywhere. And That's there was, so there were like, <laughs> it's, there was like one 800 page textbook on, on chakras. I was like, I know her, like, <laughs> I know her. Yeah. That's yep. Yeah. So like, yeah. I was just like, like just following your career and your, your <laughs> literature. I went into a new age bookstore and, and found you plastered all over the, the wall there. But I, I going back to gratitude and I just feel like it allows me to like open my chart, my heart chakra more and, and, and attract things into my life that necessarily may, may or may not have happened anyway, but I'm like radiating from that area, you know, like it just feels good. And, and like, when I can feel good, like all the other stuff doesn't really matter. No, it doesn't because we shake it off or we move through it or we grow because of it or whatever it is. So, you know, thank you for that <laughs> the remark about my books. You are much more favored in that regard than my sons who, <laughs> when, they, when they see my books, they just kind of move them <laughs> and go, you know, mom, why do you write so many books? I don't think they've ever read any of them. <laughs> really? You don't think so? <laughs> no, they have mom. <laughs> <laughs> they get their mother to tell them about energy in discrete packets, right? I particleize it for them in like little bits of advice, just in a sneaky enough way that they don't feel like I'm teaching. <laughs> ah, that's very smart. How do you like, how do you have those conversations with them? Right? Like being, being an intuitive, having these downloads or having this, this knowledge about chakras, like, you know, Gabe is a baseball player and you are, I don't know if we can mention it or not about sports, what you got going on there, but yeah, sure. We can. Of I think, I think it is so smart of you to be pursuing this, this subject of energy and sports, because it's never talked about. It's never looked at, you know, it, we're, we're, we toss so much money into rehab. We toss so much money into physical therapy for athletes. No one talks about the preventative measures, right? It's kind of like, it's what I'm about. So um, talk a little bit about that. Exactly. So in about a year, I have a book coming out, Energy Work for the Everyday to Elite Athlete. 
I am so pumped about this book. And my publisher is, it's Llewellyn. So it's a, you know, kind of a new age consciousness firm. They don't do sports book. And they're like, this is really unique. This is really going to help people, whether they're day walkers, right? Weekend warriors, you know, that college professional athlete, or they're done, you know, with a particular part of their athletic career. And it's like, how do I re package or re you know, birth myself. I think it's really important because of Gabe, uh, who's now 23, I have really learned how important athletics is. And I don't mean it's great to turn it on in the television and get lost in it. You know, it's a movement of body. It's a complete melding of body, mind, and soul. And for an athlete, again, I'm a hiker, right? That's my athletics. Now, a lot of people go, well, that's not really athletics. Well, it is. <laughs> I, I hike real hikes. I carry a pack. Well, some of them, I have buses that carry the pack from B&B &B to B&B, &B, but nonetheless, right? Um, but if you're really involved with your body at that level of any type of performance, like it can be a self-performance, like I really want to run that mile or I'm on the court, you know, and I really want to help my team win or whatever it might be you really find your strengths and those areas that need compensation or support or just need to be worked on because everything's coming through your body. And I really wasn't taking energy work and sports that seriously until a few things happened. Um, I had a dream a few years ago that Gabe was a major league baseball player and I ignored the dream. He was like 16 because he wasn't that good. <laughs> And I was like, I don't think I'm going to bring this up. His dad was a little bit more out of the picture at this point. I'd done everything but the baseball. I was like, I am not going to learn baseball. Gabe came to me about a week later and said, mom, I really want to be a major league baseball player. I thought, well, the cover's broken. Here we go. I was teaching a class in Chicago and telling this dream about how we get predictive dreams and it's going to hit you on the head if you got to listen to them. And a young man comes up to me and he goes, I'm a baseball pitcher and I'm supposed to help train your son. And you know, things just kind of move and come in place. And I was like, okay, I'm going to hire him. I'm going to stay out. I'll do the mom, you know, driving, paying this and that and the other thing until uh, we were down in North Carolina and Gabe was being trained by two amazing coaches, uh, Brandon Thielk, I think I can say their name, and Ryan Morris. And we were in a very cold dome, you know, facility. I'm freezing. I'm trying to type. I'm trying to write a book. I'm so cold and I'm bored. So I finally watch what they're doing and I feel this pain in my left shoulder. Gabe's right handed. And I can't get rid of it. So I say, Gabe, so what's, what's going on with your left shoulder? And he looks at me like I've blown my cover as an energy person, right? And I'm embarrassed him. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I go, there's something wrong with your left shoulder. What's going on? He goes, well, how do you know that? And I said, well, I can feel it. It's energy. Um, within four minutes, I had his shoulder moving completely because I could lift it a little and go, this is your issue with your mom. Want to give it back to her? This is your issue with your dad. Want to give it back to him? Mm -hmm. And that was it. He was in. It works. He's doing it. Sometimes he'll text me, mom, what do you think of this? And then he'll retext me when I answer and go, okay, is that mom answering or the voice in her head? <laughs> He wants, he wants the voice. <laughs> he doesn't want mom. He wants the voice. <laughs> so isn't that funny? <laughs> it is funny. Like I, I just, I think it's, it's just awesome that you can connect with your son on that. And, and we it, love it. Mm -hmm. And it's sports too. It's a place that uh, hasn't tapped. Well, I don't know anybody that's tapped into that yet. Um, it hasn't been energy, right? Visualization though, too. Um, Visualization. Uh, you know, tapping, using the AccuPoints, uh, you know, there are some super easy techniques that get you aligned. I mean, when you're talking any sport, you're talking mechanics, you're never going to have perfect mechanics. So how do you work that from an energy point of view? You're talking about cardinal planes and axes and rotation and all this stuff that sort of confounds me that's easier for me approaching it with subtle energy diet but diet's not just diet 
protein has a certain meaning. Uh, water gives you a certain, you know, sort of subtle energy. So that's what I'm really into is adding something to the field, no pun intended, right? Not taking away from what's there, not discounting the need to have a really smart workout and to get assessed and to get your, you know, food app and get your macro and micro nutrients, but supplementing. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll be giving the entire team ancestral healing. Like I could see it now. Like, <laughs> Don't they need it? <laughs> oh my, yeah. I mean, the body, right? The body holds so body. much trauma in it. Like it, mem it, it's like its own thing, its own piece of consciousness where like it remembers everything. Like if you go into like deep um, hypnosis and like you allow it to speak for itself, like it's going to remember every past drama that's ever happened to you. We just consciously try to block it out. Can you imagine some of the baseball players just from trauma, like just family trauma events, like what, how much that's holding them back? Oh, it's really everything and dark energies. I mean, there's a little bit of that ancestral energies. I really think that's probably about it's in our connective tissue ancestors memories. We have 14 generations of them chemically around our genetics and a lot of it is negative. A lot of it weighs us down. You know, a lot of it stops us from moving forward or gives us aches and pains. I had heart conditions that were epigenetics that I cleared energetically, which is awesome. Um, but there's good stuff in there too. There's grit, there's successes, there's powers, there's, there's intuitions. You know, there's ways of being intuitive or being in flow that we can also access. So we have everything in us. It is on us to become aware of it and to sort it to the best of our abilities. Mm. I heard someone say, I, I listened to, I don't know if your son would be into this, but Mulligan's Brothers, which is a, a YouTube channel, and you might like it. I, I listen to it every day for motivation, but it's like, a list of speakers and it's nothing but motivational music, motivational speakers like Wayne Dyer, um, The Rock, people like that are on there just talking. And I think it was Wayne Dyer was on there. He was like, everything that you need to be successful is already in you. You just need to learn how to, you know, access that. That could be, Amen. you know, Amen. Like that's, that's as simple as that. I think it's that simple. You open it up and then because of the way energy works, I mean, we're mainly subtle energy, 99.999% of us. When we open up that positive and that can mean something different in different scenarios, it's going to match the, the likewise energy outside of us. So I, I have a friend, his name's Michael Scroggins. He's way too smart for me. He has 18, 19, 20, I don't know how many advanced degrees. I was on Coast to Coast one time, it's a nighttime show when I was talking. And a few years ago, he sent me an email uh, the next day and he goes, you almost understand energy, but let me teach you the rest. <laughs> Right. So he's still teaching me and I am getting him to write his own book on how the universe really works. It's fascinating. And, um, you know, his, his modeling of how we manifest, all right, which works similarly to healing is here, here I am, here's my body and everything I need is inside of me. Think of it just very easy as charges. There's negative charges, there's positive charges. And I don't mean electrons versus protons in this minute. Let's say charges like memory, thought that are harmful and charges like memories, thoughts, feelings, whatever, hopes, dreams that are positive. And we may not know that the negatives are the stronger ones and whatever you know, whatever we're focused on, whatever is the strongest, we'll, we'll find it's like charges in the universe. And then that's what happens in our life. But you can consciously decide, hey, there's this positive inside of me. I want to accentuate that. I want God, universe, source to help bring that up. You don't have to always neutralize all the negative stuff. We can't all the time. But I want to really emphasize the positive. When we decide that, that's like your gratitude, appreciation, positivity, hope, getting help, whatever it is. I want to accentuate that. That also matches what's outside. And when you have something outside match with what's inside, guess what? 
that's what gets created in your life. Mm. So we're choosing inside. I'm not a law of attraction gal. I don't believe it's about the thoughts. I believe it. I don't know what I would say. It's more about how you hold your soul. You know what I mean? What you're deciding to make important inside, because we're never going to be perfect at canceling out the negatives or thinking perfectly. It's mm. not a perfection process. Yeah. I don't think you ever get rid of the negatives, right? No. Like, like Jim, Jim Rohn, the, um, the speaker was like, you know, you look at a, a, a jar of water and, and people will say, you know, I'm a half, uh, half glass or half, half full person, or I'm a, I'm a glass half empty person. He's like, yeah, it's, it's okay for both of them. Right. It's just, you gotta, you gotta choose, right? Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that it's, you know, you view it as half empty. That's fine. You can deal with that, but don't choose to think like that. Right. Like, you know, it's there, but yes try to flow your energy in a different direction. That's it. It's, it's all, it's that choice. And I know for myself where there's an area that maybe I know I don't really believe <laughs> something's going to go right. Or I have my own resistant, like, oh, I'm really too scared to let that happen. I will turn it over. I'm a believer in surrender and turning it over. I'm not that good at it all the time. So my tricks with it are to say like, you know, I'm, you know, willing to let go and let God, even where I'm not willing to do it <laughs> or, you know, I'm trying to surrender. So I just want, you know, God universe source to just come in and take it from me. Cause I don't think I'm letting go. So just take it. So I think it's great to be honest. If we're honest, we get more help. Sure. Um, more help, more help. I, that's one thing I wanted to talk to you about was like, I did watch a video on you and, and speaking to our guides, uh, the universe or God, however you want to, uh, you know, put that for yourself. But like, how do we, how do we receive messages, right? Like, how do you get yourself into that state? So I think there's different ways to do it and it can be helpful to have a sense of what your highest, maybe most accessible form of, you know, being or intuition is. There's many, many different types of intuition. I mean, everybody wants to be clairvoyant, which is to get pictures, but they don't always realize that, that the pictures can come in dreams or you can see, you can ask God, ask your guides. Like I want, you know, I, I want guidance and you might see a billboard or 10 billboards or license plates that all have the same message. So, you know, intuition can be a physical, come through a physical medium as well as more of the mystical. So we tend to be, you know, more visual or some people are really verbal. Maybe they hear voices in their head or they get their messages, you know, from podcasts or when they're reading or conversations. And a lot of us are feeling based physically based, sort of more cognitive, intuitive. We just know something. Maybe we get messages, you know, from an awareness or a consciousness. Like we just know what God's trying to share with us. So sometimes we get the messages just plain from the environment, from, you know, what bird floats, you know, kind of by when we're thinking about something. So first get a sense of, are you more, you know, kind of physical, emotional, you know, a little bit more gut or mental, more spiritual, maybe more verbal, maybe more visual, what, you know, kind of floats your boat. So you pay attention in those areas. And for myself, I'm really different when I'm giving a session to people than when I'm in my everyday life. In a session with people, I'm really visual. I get tons of images and I get words because those are easiest to communicate to somebody, right? In my everyday world, I'm much more physical. I'm really kinesthetic. I get just awarenesses and I've learned to follow them. And when the universe isn't getting through to me, I, I literally <laughs> will get uh, things falling over, um, you know, the deer running across my car, and I know what that means. I'll get very, very environmental, physical senses, you know, from outside or from inside of myself. So I think you, I think you just need to be aware. Um, if there's something and I feel really blocked, I'll just sit down, you know, I'll directly go to God. I like to go to God and then let God assign the teams to help me. It's just faster and you can trust what you're getting. And I'll just say, you know, I need... I need guidance within three days or whatever it is. 
Usually you're not going to get it in five minutes. So be realistic. I need guidance within three days or within a week. I need to know this. And it comes. It will be obvious because I also tell God, you know me better than I know myself and you know how stubborn I am. So get the message across. Um, three years ago, my mother died and it was a beautiful death process, to be honest. And she died on a Tuesday. I'm, uh, I was there with my oldest son when she was passing. My mother was very sneaky <laughs> because I knew she didn't want to die when my sisters were there and they had been 24 seven. And so they left really briefly for dinner and my son and I were there and she died through in, inside of those 10 minutes. She smiled and left. We were kind of like little kids. We were like, I said, do you think she's dead? I think she stopped breathing. He goes, well, I think she stopped breathing. I said, well, take her pulse. He picked up her you know, wrist. I said, well, does she have a pulse? He goes, I don't know what an old person's pulse feels like. So, you know, but after she was leaving, I asked her departing spirit. I said, you know, will you come and give me a sign that you're okay? Next night, a Wednesday night, I'm teaching and I'm sitting, you don't know it, but I'm in a basement and with a lot of lights and over there is a room with tons of books. So I'm teaching and the door shut. The dogs are upstairs. Nobody else is home. And all of a sudden I hear these noises in the back room. So when we take a break in the teaching, there's two books out of thousands that have fallen off the shelves. Two books. I have thousands of books. One was Edgar Casey, Life After Life. Hello, mom. The other was a book I didn't even know I owned. I never, I swear I'd never seen it before. It was some bizarre book titled, um, well, that was weird and I don't want to do it again. <laughs> Basically my mom's assessment looking back. Okay. That was something else. I think I'm done. <laughs> so, wow. you know, when you're, when you come from that good heart place and you turn it over, like, just get me a message, you'll get a message and you won't be able to avoid it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I get messages all like when I ask, when I get frustrated uh -huh. and, I, and I say, please, please, I need to know if I'm on my path, like in the next day, something will happen that is just so, so out of the norm of things that happen. And then you know that you, you've been hurt. It's well, that's amazing. the pinpoint. It's out of the norm. It's extra sensory. It's, you know, pair on normal. <laughs> it's mm. beyond norm. Is there a way that you typically get your messages? I'm just curious. I, uh, so if I get really frustrated, I'll ask for something and then something yeah. will happen. Right. Um, out of the norm, but you, typically what I'll get is a number sequence. So you said that, uh, yeah, um, I'll get like fours <clears throat> everywhere. Oh. Right. So I'll get fours, uh, 44, um, uh, it will be on license plates. It will be on billboards. It will be on my watch. I'll look down and it, it'll be like eight 44 <laughs> every time, like every time. And it's like, it's so in my face that I can't say it's chance. It's not chance. It's like that noticeable. It's outside of chance, but um, it, it's so I've asked around like angels uh, numbers and Googled it. And so there's a couple of different meanings from it, but it, like it, 44, I think it means that you have angels surrounding you and they're at, they're waiting for you to ask for help, you know? So like, uh, of course, every time I see it, I just ask for help. And when I get really frustrated, I might make a, a, a louder help cry and then something even more irregular will happen and it's just kind of like it just strengthens the concept that we are greater than our physical bodies and that we are connected to something greater and that uh, it gives me the motivation that I need to keep pushing through those down days it's beautiful and I don't know if this happens for you but with my youngest I get signs for him I'll get dreams I'll get signs sometimes they'll say mom you know what's going on and okay I'll, and I'll just have to say give me a couple of days and I'll get you a sign and they're clear and he gets his own signs too um and they're very they're very in the face because the more the need he has, the more obvious it is. Like you're saying, like I'll see a sign that literally has the words, 
that he needs on them. My oldest son and his fiance, yeah, they're getting married after eight years. I'm really happy. Oh, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> I know. You know, he doesn't really want input like that. He doesn't want me to talk the energy stuff. I don't know if I told you this on my on the first time I was here, but what they like me to do is to basically channel presence for them. Mm. So they don't tell me what they need. And this started a few years ago when they lived in this very, very dinky carriage house in Washington, DC. They didn't had no kitchen equipment. And I knew that. But I woke up one day and I thought, I need to look at Williams Sonoma. I don't have cooking equipment. I don't, I am very simple. I have a pan. I'm good with a pan personally. So I am not that person who knows the difference between this kind of bottom and that kind of bottom or copper and whatever, right? But I looked at William Sonoma and I saw a red Breville uh, waffle maker. I thought I'm gonna buy a red Breville waffle maker. I don't make waffles. And I said, I think that's for my oldest son and his partner. So I had it shipped. They called me. It, it never gave the gift tag. And they go, did you buy us a red Breville waffle maker? And I go, yeah. They go, we were just talking about getting one a few weeks ago, but we couldn't afford it. That kicked off mom, the present giver. They never tell me what they need. <laughs> and I get an intuition and I send it. Even, even like these certain types of scrubby towels. Like I had no idea. I just was, I'm going to send them these scrubby towels, whatever they are. I don't even know what they're called. And my daughter-in-law texted me. She goes, why did you get us those? I go, I don't know. I was just thinking about them. She goes, we use those and they were all worn out. So it, it doesn't, you know, this intuition thing can be really fun. Also, I gave them their honeymoon, by the way. So, um, I'm very invested. I don't really care if they get married. I just adore them. So, you know, we'll, if we listen for others, not in a way that's psychic spying or forcing them into something, you know, who knows what, you know, kind of good we can do in the world too. Sure. I tell you what, I wish I had more time. That's what I, I <laughs> if you could, if you give me one more present, it'd be more time, you know, talking about this stuff with you. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining again. Um, we have to do it again sometime. We uh, will. What? So how can people connect with you? How can they reach you? Super simple. CindyDale.com. Sign up for my newsletter. I recommend that. C-Y-N-D-I-Dale.com. One stop shop.